Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Careers in Music and Technology Lecture Series. I'm Chris Bobrowski, lead faculty for the Electronic Music Program and the new Music and Technology Program that we're developing. Uh, we're very happy to have this series. This is actually the last one for our academic year. Um, <clears throat> and the idea of this series is to bring people that are in working in the music and technology field from various areas of that field and talk about their own career path because they, as if those of you who know who've been to some of the other talks, you know, there's a lot of different ways you can go in this area. Um, so I'm extra excited today when we can bring someone who's actually a CSM alum to campus. And uh, today we have with us Christian Tumalon who's a CSM alum and also a Grammy Award winner. <laughs> Christian's a musician, an amazing pianist, keyboardist, uh, also a producer, recording artist, has recorded with a number of uh, very experienced and amazing musicians in the field. Um, you can read about them all in, in his bio here. Uh, so that was, I'm hoping that maybe one of the things you talk about is recording versus uh, live performance, that kind of thing. And it's also done um, recording in studios and producing for other people. Uh, has also worked for um, sound design development and sampling development for native instruments. Uh, so, as you can see, a lot of variety in what he's done, and I'm excited to hear more about it. So, please help me welcome Christian Tumalan. Well, uh, it's just a pleasure. Thank you for the invitation, uh, Christine, for being here, and also an old friend of mine, Christine, as well. It's been many years, right? Uh, Ten years ago, I was here, uh, walking into the aisles of CSM, trying to figure out what's gonna, what was going to be my musical life. And uh, you know, it's always an exploration about what to do, right? I mean, uh, we are here to learn, uh, but you know, there's always a question, you know, what am I gonna do after this? You know, what's happening with me in the world? And I think it's great what you're doing with these talks because perf uh, perhaps, and my hope today is to give you some perspective about, uh, with my story, um, to see if it inspires you to, to define your career path. Um, I don't like talking about myself, but I think it's necessary to just bring some information for you uh, with the hopes that this will uh, give you a reference. We can, you could take that as a reference, okay? Um, but anyway, just very briefly, uh, so that's pretty much my uh, life career, starting at uh, seven years old, at five, seven, I started classical piano with this lady that I hated, and uh, she had me playing all these scales and stuff with no purpose, and I quit. But at that point, I, I knew that I wanted to do music. I, music was just something I wanted to do. I didn't know how. So I ended up quitting. And then after that, um, when I was about a teenager, uh, I got fascinated with the organ. You know, the two keyboards, one on top and the bottom. The Yamaha Electron chords that they offer, uh, you know, it's very fun for kids. And then uh, I think it gave me a lot of uh, fingers and technique. Uh, and more importantly, uh, independence. Independence because you have to play the, you know, the pedals and the two keyboards and then the other uh, manages the volume and all that. So I, I really like the instrument. And then after that, I uh, did um, a course for preparation into the university, music university. That was a very intense course uh, about everything, theory, harmony, counterpoint, composition. And then I had to choose an instrument. And I didn't have an organ, so I had to choose uh, a keyboard-related instrument, so a piano. I have to say, at the age of 15, that was my first um, approach to the actual piano as instrument. So I started from the bottom. My teachers would tell me that I started too late. I was pretty embarrassed because everybody around me was like way ahead uh, playing you know, Beethoven sonatas, Mozart sonatas, and I was the only one playing, you know, uh, back minuets and try to sight read. I've always been very bad sight reader, by the way. Uh, 
As a quick note, I just recently learned that Beethoven was a very bad uh, sight reading uh, person. He actually was very embarrassed because he could not read notes very well. <laughs> I learned that very well at the beginning, but of course later he became very much better. Um, okay, so uh, after that I uh, applied for the National Conservatory in Mexico. Uh, I got rejected, I didn't pass the test. Um, so I was a little disappointed. So the that year I think that was the year that I really, really studied harder everything that I could especially harmony and counterpoint, counterpoint, as I said. Um, that was the, the hardest ones for me. And then luckily, the year after, I got accepted by the university. Um, the cool thing about this is, this is something about studying overseas, uh, if you're ever considering that. It's about uh, the tuition. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I always make a point here, and I think you guys, being here in community college, I want to applaud you because you're doing a smart move from your career from the beginning. Why? Because I've seen so many cases of students going straight to university and end up with this huge bill that they have to pay. And I think you guys are doing something very smart here, trying to get as much as you can from community colleges and people like you guys that are really trying to be the best. So this is uh, my very first insider recommendation. This is great what you're doing already. Um, so in Mexico, I only had to pay 50 cents a year for my college education. Uh, of course, it was government funded, uh, but that allowed me to expand the number of classes that I would attend to. So I got a little ambitious and I wanted to, you know, at that point, I, I knew music was what I wanted to do for life. I just didn't know exactly what. So I ended up trying to take everything in the school. I took classical, I took jazz, I took a composition, um, and a lot of all the different areas, including uh, accompanying for uh, ballet dancers and uh, all sorts of classes. So I ended up doing that from the age of 18 and 23. And I think I got most of the knowledge, um, technical knowledge, uh, musical knowledge from, from there, from those years, I think I was pretty much studying music until 1, 2 in the morning, wake up at 6 in the morning and continuing. I guess at that age, you can actually manage to do that. <laughs> um, anyway, so um, after that, for uh, personal reasons, I moved to the United States. And then I wanted to continue my educations because I never earned a diploma. I actually, please don't tell anyone, I don't have a diploma. I don't have a degree. So I wanted to have something in paper to prove to the world that I, I am someone. And then this is what I enrolled into CSM. And I met uh, Christ, uh, Christine and then um, I, I knew I had this thing about production. I had no idea where to start. My first insight about production was where uh, my parents bought me the Triton, the Cork. Court Triton, uh, the, the, the workstation. So that was, for me, that was like a nice toy because you could do a sequencing. I started to mess with the oscillators and uh, effects and all of that. So that was, for me, very fascinating. I think I did everything by intuition because you have to understand, guys, uh, that was 19, what, 1995, 1997, and U2 was not around quite there yet. So if you wanted to learn something, there was no YouTube, guys. You had to go to the library that perhaps was like four hours away <laughs> from my hometown, and I had to take the bus from, from Cuernavaca to Mexico City and try to make it to the library that had the information about acoustics and oscillators and all that. So that was a four hour trip for me to learn just one lesson about how to handle attack and release. So that's very different from today, just making that note. So anyway, when I arrived to CSM, I, I have to confess, uh, Christine, I didn't see a point of learning acoustics and the waves and the crest and the valley and all of that. I didn't see a point, but I'm like, something told me that I had to uh, learn it because, uh, I don't know, something was to keep drawing me into your class. And then I uh, ended up being, actually for me, 
this information that I read in the books that you taught me, I find it um, as a back information for me to make decisions almost every day into how I produce, uh, either mixing, either arranging for orchestra, for big band, or even playing. It's all about how the acoustics relate to each other. You know, you can have all electronic music in your ears or in your environment, but still they have to move through air. And when it's done in a well-balanced way, this is when music like it. So Beethoven, Mozart, they knew this. When they arranged their music, they did not only wrote the notes, they also were conscious about how these notes, how the effect of the waveforms are gonna affect the audience. So I, uh, I think that this is a great insight for you guys. Not only about creating music, I recommend you also question yourself how these things I'm making on the computer, on the synthesizer, in your DAW, are going to resonate acoustically with the ears of the people that are listening to this music. I think this is the key point. Um, so uh, moving on, so uh, a little bit after CSM, I uh, started my first recording studio in my back shed, and uh, you know, I did some soundproofing, and then I started recording. I was so eager to start recording and doing some music. I had to say something. I made a huge mistake, and I didn't know that because I didn't have the insight. Uh, the mistake was I did not treat my room. You, I cannot tell you the number of mixes that I had to revise because I just didn't get it right. And uh, after a while, after I moved out from the shed, I realized, okay, my room was wacky. It was all inconsistent with frequencies. So my first foremost advice into music produce, production is that you get a treated room. Uh, there's many uh, ways to do it economically um, with rock wool construction and panels. And if you get handy with hammers and wood, you can probably do it. Uh, I know a lot of people mix and make music with headphones, that's, that's fine, but it's always good that you have a good room that is treated at home. And it's very possible these days. Uh, so that, that's my first advice. Um, moving on, so um, during this back shed, I did a lot of projects, including my first Latin band project. I recorded uh, in this little room, I have to say as little as this circle right here, the the light color circle until the end of the projector. It's a very small room, and I recorded an entire album with uh, probably over 17 musicians in the album. And then that album uh, got in the top 10. In fact, it was number one in Latin America for two months in a row, <laughs> something that I had recording in this little room. So, um, it, so after that, I moved to San Francisco. I decided to expand. I um, rented a warehouse, that's the one that you went to, uh, Christine, at some point. And then I had separate rooms. I was really excited about continuing this recording. And then finally, um, I recorded the orchestra album that won the Grammy. So people keep asking me, so how you recorded that album? And the way I did it was with a Prisoners mixer. It was a 16-channel Prisoners with two, one pair of event monitors and my Mac. And some SM58s. Sure, and maybe a couple of condenser mics, uh, the, the cheap ones, Rhodes, not the Nauman, because <laughs> it's expensive. So that was a very, very uh, unexpensive way to record an album that actually won the Grammy. So uh, a lot of people ask me about what happened after the Grammy, but I like to tell the story, what happened before the Grammy. What happened before the Grammy was just me being at the warehouse, treating my room the best I could, I remember one weekend I installed new floors because the concrete was actually creating a lot of bad um, early reflections in my recordings. So I uh, did a laminate floor, then we put some cushions and some rock wool, and then that was the room that, uh, that I used to record the album uh, for the entire orchestra. So uh, that's it. Mm -hmm. uh, other question people ask me about plugins, right? How many plugins you use in the record that won the Grammy? And I did not use any plugin that was not in my DAW. In this case, Digital Performer. Uh, there's this uh, thing about people buying plugins and getting plugins, thinking that 
their mixes are going to sound better the, the, the more plugins they buy. And I'm going to tell you, well, there's plugins that might make your workflow better and faster, but it's not going to replace the experience that you have with just one plugin. I believe that if you have one EQ and you know how to use it properly, it should not matter which brand or what features it has. You know what a 400K is versus a 4K is, then this is you should know. So uh, my second advice is get really, really familiar with all the frequencies. Frequencies are your, your friends. Uh, and when you are not friends with them, they can be your worst enemies, <laughs> especially mastering. Mastering is when you realize, ah, okay? So uh, I believe there's so many courses or programs that train your ear online, right? Maybe you're more familiar with that. At some point, I had one that was uh, passed to me from someone studying in Berkeley School of Music. So I believe you can get it online for free. So it's these little trainers programs that train your ear to define, okay, what is I'm hearing? Am I hearing 10K? Am I hearing 200K? Oh, this frequency. So this might take you a couple of weeks to master, but let me tell you, this is gold for the rest of your um, life, okay? Just getting really, really familiar with what frequency uh, does and what doesn't, okay? So uh, that's my second biggest advice. Mm -hmm. uh, I've heard this from Tony Maserati at a conference in the Billboard. He said, if you have good EQ and good capturing, it's a possibility that you might not use to you not need to use any compression. So what that says is that EQ might end up doing 90% of the work if you really know how to do it right. The rest is just part of the makeup you put in it, right? That was actually a great advice because I used to fill my strip with plugins trying to get the sound that I wanted when I first only had to really fix properly my EQ from the beginning, okay? You name it, high pass, low pass, started from there. That, you know, uh, fixes a lot of problems. But anyway, I don't want to get too technical into mixing. But um, eh, so that won the Grammy. That was a great experience. Uh, I'm still a regular guy. Thank you. Um, eh, after that, we uh, have my first national tour. Um, with Tito Puente and then some other great artists with uh, Columbia Artist Management, a uh, great company uh, in New York, based in New York. And then um, from age 35 until today, I've been um, performing internationally, Switzerland, Montreal Jazz Festival, Italy, France, uh, Mexico, South America, um, blah, blah, blah. So that's a little bit of a brief story about my music career. Uh, I just brought here another uh, So this is uh, my discography um, through the years. I think uh, Sina's uh, EP is included here. Of course, I'm including here. She has an EP, by the way, on Spotify. Uh, so uh, pretty much uh, I wanted to bring this in because I have done most of the mixing for all these records that are commercial, commercially released. Uh, but my, my point of showing you this is that the highlight in, in yellow is the one that won the Grammy. So you can see that it took many tries to get to a point that I could say, hey, this mixing, this production now is worth its Grammy material. So uh, it's important that if you're creating music, might not be the best to start. You see, um, it, took, it takes years for you to develop your sound, to develop your art, your craft, your, your, your skill set. But the most important thing is that you keep trying, you keep trying, you keep trying. When you try, then something comes out great, okay? That is my, my second advice, okay? Doesn't matter how your music sounds like, it sounds like other people, don't worry about it. There's a great uh, book that is called Still Like an Artist. And it's a book that talks about how music has evolved by copying other people before. So copying people actually is a great exercise because it gives you reference. If your music sounds like someone else, that's totally fine because you probably are the one who's gonna make the difference to the next stage 
in in that genre, whatever you like, you know, techno, indie, rock, uh, salsa, whatever you like. So um, yeah, that's my discography. It goes the list is still going is down right here. And um, during the the music production uh, work that I did at the studio, I uh, got contacted by Nicky Marinik. If you are not familiar by, for, uh, with his name, he is the creator of, of Contact, the one that uh, drives Sibelius um, sounds. And he, when he started this uh, company, he did not start the company, but he started the programming. He's a tech guy. Uh, he wanted to capture the real sounds of all the instruments in the world. That was his goal for life. So I think he's very well known for you know all the libraries that he started uh, back in the 90s, I remember, right? The contact libraries back in the 90s. So uh, he contacted me uh, after the Grammy. He got my name from somewhere in the industry. And he said, I have a project for you. Uh, I want to recreate the Latin sound. And this is a guy from Germany, OK? He's in Berlin, Germany. Uh, when they have absolutely no idea about how for Cuban music works. Mm -hmm. Even here, okay, it's not easy to get access to that information. So uh, I say, okay, yes, I'll take it. I was actually very excited. So the project was divided in many different stages. Um, the first stage was to capture the samples for all the instruments, the congas, the bongos, the cowbells, the clave, all the instruments that you see in the Latin section. And then uh, my job was to make sure that the samples were competitive to the sound because um, you can have a sa the same instrument, but when it's sampled differently, then it has a different color, it has a different sound, and sometimes might not reflect entirely with the genre you're working in, right? So sampling is very important. Sampling techniques is really, really important, especially capturing real instruments when, when you are approaching a particular style of music, in this case, uh, Latin music. Uh, so uh, that was the first stage. Uh, all the samples were made in Germany. I was not there, but he would pass me the, 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 the pack of samples for one instrument, let's say the bongos, right? So I just had to verify that it was played right, all the all the ve uh, velocities, all the levels were right because for each touch, there's many different levels. I don't know if any one of you have seen a sample from, let's say, a piano from Native Instruments. Have you guys seen how it looks? It looks like different layers. One note. Um, I think for each note, there's over 500 samples for each one. And that includes all the velocities. That also includes the different microphones they use. That also includes the room uh, microphone. It's pretty amazing how they do it. Anyway, so after I got the package of samples, then Nikki told me, OK, well, here's the samples. Now you create the patterns. You be the musician that creates all the patterns. So that was quite a task because the, the samples were laid out on the keyboard, of course, on a MIDI keyboard. And I had to play like I'm playing physically uh, bongo, but with the MIDI in real time. That was quite a challenge because I think the first two months before recording anything in MIDI, I had to get used to playing the pattern. You know, the conga pattern would sound like this. much I had to get used to the sound of the sample and play it and at the same time try to get the timing right to have the realness of the groove. So I did that. So I wanna I made a video for you guys to explain the plugin uh, really quickly. I made this video this morning. Sorry I was just waking up so it's not that great but we'll see. Hopefully explain something. All right welcome everybody students of CSM. I'm making this video for you in order to explain a little bit of what the plugin by Native Instruments Cuba is all about. All right, so you go to the website, you open Google, and you go to the Native Instruments website and type Cuba. You probably will find it there, available for download. So uh, here's the guy right here. So you can 
buy the full version. It's only $99. Uh, you go ahead and download it and buy it. Uh, make sure you have, this will work with contact, so make sure you have the latest version of contact installed in your um, computer and also in your DAW. So once it is in, let's so this is uh, the DAW. I wanna open the actual plugin. So uh, let's see, you open your contact libraries, you look for Cuba, here's the guy. Uh, you um, There's different um, uh, instruments within the instrument. Uh, the one I like the most to start is the melodic ensemble, which includes a, most of the instruments in the rhythm section for uh, this instrument. Uh, we have some bass, a piano, some Cuban threads, a little bit of trumpet, and most of the percussion family here on the side. So uh, it's a pretty cool. Uh, this plugin, uh, when um, I was contacted to uh, elaborate and um, be part of the process of making this, um, Nikki Marinik asked me to a sort of try to organize all the wide uh, variety of uh, rhythms in Latin America, especially coming from Cuba and beyond. And I uh, first thing was to get the actual samples from each instrument. So the first process, um, I was um, kind of uh, in charge of uh, advising Nikki, uh, Nikki uh, in Germany how to properly uh, sample each instrument, uh, the conga, the bongos, the cowbells, uh, especially uh, the ones on the right right here that you see. Um, so once all the samples were done, all the different touches for each instrument, then uh, he sent me the samples and he said, can you now elaborate each rhythm? So uh, I have to say that was quite a challenge because one thing is for anybody to play physically uh, any rhythm and a different stories to actually recreate that on the MIDI keyboard um, for every single note. So um, a good example is, so you have the plugin right here. So uh, you have a little browser that allows you to access all the library of uh, uh, rhythms or patterns. Those are the ones that I created. Um, let's see, we wanna pick uh, one uh, in the category of jazz. It has many different rhythms here. I wanna pick the one that says hot and spicy. Um, <clears throat> so once you select it, then you see now this is how it behaves. It's the actual matrix for the rhythms. And uh, when I click play, then you'll hear. Pretty much, uh, that's the rhythm. Uh, here, you can select the chord progression. One of the challenges for this plugin was for me to uh, record all these chord progressions uh, separately for each rhythm. So let's say you're, you're, you're hearing this rhythm, but you also hear the piano, you also hear the bass. So the rhythm, the percussion doesn't really change, but uh, the piano and bass and the tres, uh, it tends to change harmonically according to the selection. So let's say if I want to play just a one chord, C minor, C minor, C minor, C minor, for all bars, it would sound like this. Okay, if I want to switch to a different uh, rhythm, let's say this variety of chords. Cool progression. So uh, this is part of the challenge because first I have to create the actual percussion. You want to hear it here uh, in the mixer. So I want to just mute every single thing and solo the percussion. So this is what you first you got here. And that reflected in MIDI uh, signals, you will hear like this. So pretty much. is reflected in all these dots. So this dots that you see here is all the hits that I did uh, playing with the actual keyboard in order to create this uh, pattern that you hear, a rhythm. Now followed by that, I'm gonna 
open the plugin again. So I'm gonna unmute the bass. Here's the bass. That also had to be recorded uh, via MIDI. You can hear also the piano. The clave, the tress. For this particular rhythm, there's no trumpet. Okay, so this is pretty much uh, for every single chord progression, I have to create all the rhythms, all the patterns, and the notes that every single instrument plays. And uh, you can tell it was a lot of work because uh, for each rhythm in the category, every, every single one is very different. So, uh, Pretty much, uh, there was it was a lot of back and forth between the, the creator Nikki uh, and I trying to fine tune uh, a lot of aspects, which means uh, the, uh, the the quantizing of the note, how stiff he wanted to be, how loose he wanted it to be. So after that, we made the decision of actually letting the user decide how uh, the one the quantization, quantization to be, I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time with that word, uh, to be. So if you hear the same rhythm here, the, it has these three nubs that define pretty much the intensity of the MIDI notes that you hear, uh, the quantization, the feel, or uh, the style, how laid back you want it to be, or how upfront you want it to be this rhythm. So from this set of dots that I uh, showed you earlier, right here, let's see my... Uh, my track is playing. Okay, so you're here, right here. So this has, these are the notes that are every single instrument is playing. So uh, these notes are not quantized. This is exactly how I play them on the MIDI keyboard while, cre while, while creating the patterns. So here, these notes allow you, you'll hear it. If I turn it to the right, to the left, You notice that the quantization changes a little bit. Oh, that changes to the left. Also, the articulation of the notes changes a little bit to create different vibes in the groove. Okay, it's a slightly different, but you, you're probably gonna be able to appreciate it on the other rhythms. So uh, yeah, it has uh, most of uh, Latin American uh, rhythms I try to include includes the Cuban rumbas, includes the cumbia. This one is fun. Let's hear it. We can change the chord progression. Mm -hmm. It has some uh, bachata or merengue. Let's try the merengue. And again, you can always uh, play with the mixer. You can always mute the instruments as you are creating your music. And let's say you can mute the treads, you can mute the piano, or even the bass, and you can actually generate a very cool uh, a rhythm texture or create some sounds, some cool bass on top of this given rhythm that I already have made for you. Um, so uh, here's the plugin, pretty cool. Um, after you create your own patterns, uh, this uh, plugin has this thing when you can either play it with the host or you can actually trigger a key on your keyboard and it will play the rhythm automatically for you. You don't have to even think about every note uh, um, that you have to play. It's all there for you to create on top of that. So I'm really happy with this plugin. Um, it was released uh, a few years ago. And I think they're still fine tuning a couple of things. Um, towards the end of the project, um, we were running out of budget. So uh, I wish that a couple of things were modified, um, including the Wiro and some of the maraca sounds that um, still I'm not really happy with it. But uh, as native instruments um, have the reputation to try to recreate as much as possible to reality, how the instruments sound in real life. But I think uh, in the overall, uh, I think it's a pretty cool thing to have. Uh, even though you are end up not using this plugin uh, too much, uh, personally, I use it at the start of any production to give me a little bit of a rhythmic um, start, something inspiring to start and I create on top of that. 
uh, any music you're creating, you know, techno, dance, uh, indie, whatever you're doing, I think it's a good start to bring some ideas into your productions. All right, well, here it is. Um, enjoy it. Uh, if you want to try it at home, in your home studio or whatever you work, uh, it would be great to know your feedback, see what you think of it. All right, well, thank you. Uh, see you around. Thank you. Bye. See you. Okay, that was it. Yeah. Right, so that's the plug-in. Yeah. Um, check it out. It's a, if you don't have it, it's, a, it's pretty cool. Um, all right, so moving on from, from this. Uh, I have some questions that uh, Christine asked me over email that uh, I would like to answer. Um, what got you into music? And uh, I have to say, I don't know, really. Uh, the only thing I know is that I was called by it. I kept always bouncing back to the idea, I have to do something with music. I don't know what's going to be. And if you guys have that call, regardless of what else you do, what else other people want you to do, right? Because that's the thing. You know, you have the family, you have the friends always asking you, hey, you know, you can make some money this way, this way, this way, right? But if music doesn't call you, then maybe music is not for you. If you're here because music keeps calling you, I think this is the right place to be. You're just trying to find your path somehow. So uh, I think that was my story. Uh, just keep calling me in many, many different ways. I didn't know exactly um, what was going to be the end, but uh, here I am, you know, trying to uh, do a little bit of everything here and there. Um, Okay, the next question was, uh, what led you down the path of sound engineering? Uh, as I mentioned, I think uh, my first start was with the Korg Triton Studio with the workstation. And I think that was the start for me to start messing with sounds and recording and all that. So I think that was the, the origins that I already mentioned before. Um, tell more how you integrate your work as a musician and engineer. So uh, I think uh, my knowledge in music, I find it a lot when I am doing harmonizers, any type of vocal harmonizers, I need to define uh, in the plugins that I have, what are the, the path for, for the notes that I have to choose, what are the keys, or what are the intervals. Uh, if you're a music creator, and uh, the first advice that I would give you as far as music theory, Learn intervals. Intervals is the first thing that I think you should have very clear in your head. What's a minor second minor versus a major second? What's a fifth, uh, diminished fifth versus an augmented fifth? These kind of concepts that would be the first thing that I would advise you as far as music theory. Um, also, my knowledge in music when I am mixing, uh, I learned this from orchestration a lot. Uh, I I was doing orchestration for orchestra, big band, how to orchestrate with four trombones, four saxophones, bass, uh, and all of that. So I think that knowledge has helped me when I am EQing to think about the way I think is about, okay, an EQ is like a huge orchestra. What I want this to sound more, the violins on the high end or the basses on the low end. Of course, of course, that sounds very basic, right? But when you are messing with a lot of frequencies, when you have 10 tracks, 20 tracks, then this is, it has a real play on how you accommodate them, all of them together, like in an orchestra. So I like to think of it that way, that um, my EQs, my compressors are a member in the orchestra that has a place and uh, it needs to be harmoniously placed in the mix, of course, right? Uh, it doesn't happen overnight, guys. It takes months or even years to really get something as basic as four or five tracks right, okay? But um, it'll happen. Just be patient, keep doing, okay? And again, treat your rooms. Make sure your rooms are treated. Make sure you have good monitors. I made the mistake of mixing for many years with a known brand, I don't want to say names because this is filming, so I don't want to get in conflict with companies here. Uh, if there's one piece of equipment that I would advise you to spend more of your money is in monitors. Because monitors is your window to the sound. If you don't have a good monitor, 
then you are getting a partial information into your ear about what is the sound that you are reproducing on the computer, right, into your ears. So uh, good monitors, please. If a monitor costs less than $300, I would question that. <laughs> so everything probably a little bit above that, I think it starts to be worth uh, a good mixing, okay? Um, all right, so that's uh, next one. How are we doing with time? Uh, get in there? Yeah? Okay, uh, next question was, can you elaborate on the recording process behind the Grammy? Uh, I'm sorry? I already did, kind of did, yes. Uh -huh. All right, um, so uh, I guess to wrap it up today, I mean, there's so many things that I can talk about maybe after this. Maybe I'm open to some questions. Maybe I can elaborate more if you want me to say more. Um, I want to leave you with uh, four key topics for success because I believe that the people that chose to be here today are not there in the cafeteria having a coffee. Is the people that want to be successful because you're already promoting something to your career, being in extraordinary extra, you know, classes and seminars that are really giving you that extra information to be successful. So uh, I have four main ones. The first one is, okay, ready for the first one. First one is learn how to manage your finances. Because I cannot tell you the number of stories I hear of musicians. I've interacted with all kinds of musicians, uh, electronic producers, jazz musicians, uh, a Latin rock, whatever, right? And a, a, there's always an issue with finances. And finances is what's going to define the quality of your equipment. If you have some money in your pocket, then your equipment is going to be better, and then your sound is going to be better. If you have a good computer, then you're going to deliver work faster because your processor is faster because you have a good computer. And that comes with money, okay? So... Um, if you, uh, I recommend you a very good book that changed my life because I struggled as a musician for many years trying to manage the financial part and do whatever I want to do, right? How many times you, you heard, yeah, I'm working at office work because I just have to pay my bills and at the extra time, I just do it for music. And I don't want that for you. I want that the other way around. I want you to be doing music Whatever 90% it's going to be, and the other 10%, well, you know, for something else maybe. Or maybe 100%, I don't know. Uh, so uh, a good book I recommend is Dave Ramsey's uh, The Complete Money, Money Makeover. Let me say this again. The Complete Money Makeover. That's a great book that shows you everything with how to wisely invest on your college education all the way to investing into your own self. So I think this is uh, the first one I would give you. It's a great, um, great advice. Um, second one is related to the first one, invest in good equipment, as I, as I said. Okay. Uh, you can cut corners in microphones. You can probably cut corners on the desk you're using, maybe, maybe the MIDI controllers, you know. But there's things that you cannot cut corners. And one thing is the monitors, as I mentioned to you. Uh, your computer processor, um, good memory, good uh, capacity, have an external hard drive. Uh, I cannot tell you the number of uh, times I hear uh, starting uh, producers that are dealing with storage. They just can't produce because they, there's no capacity in the hard drive. And that probably lacks everything, right? Your workflow, your motivation, everything. So. I will start with a very nice SSD hard flash drive, nah, maybe at least four terabytes, with the idea that you're gonna be making a lot of information, maybe making a lot of terabytes of garbage, and you don't have to worry about it because you are creating, okay? It's like an artist, you have a canvas, right? The more canvases you have to mess and make mistakes, the better possibilities you have to get better. Okay, so uh, hard drive is a very good um, one. That I would not cut corners. Third one, <laughs> cables. <laughs> Please invest in good cables because a bad cable can give you a real nightmare. 
anything, a MIDI cable, uh, a USB cable, a uh, mic cable, okay? Uh, I cannot tell you the amount of budgets uh, in big studios they spend on just cables. It's pretty insane because, you know, the pros think, believe that, you know, the cables are important. Uh, and what monitors, I mentioned that, monitors, and that's it. So that's are the main things that I think uh, I would do. Uh, and a surge protector, please. Have a surge protector at home, something that protects you from the electricity going up and down. You know how PG&E acts lately? <laughs> so because all that investment on your equipment can go like this, a split of a second because the current of electricity went too high on your equipment. So that's another one that you can get. That's fortunately not that expensive. Best Buy, you can get around for like 70 bucks or something, 30 bucks, 50 bucks, whatever. Okay. So that's the thing. That's the main thing. All right. So moving to the next one, third one. Network. So uh, to succeed in this business is very important to network. A network doesn't mean that you have to be this extroverted person talking to everyone. It's okay. You can be an introverted person that doesn't like talking to anyone. That's totally fine. You still try to make connections with people in your field. How you meet these people? Well, uh, I recommend first uh, uh, seeking for seminars that are related to music. Uh, the ones that are my favorites are the NAMM show in LA. I used to be a skeptic about this because everybody goes there to show off and show the skills and, you know. Uh, yes, that's on the outside on the, of the event, but when you actually get to meet people that are behind the curtains, you get to meet the producers that are making the plugins, you get to meet the people that are songwriting, that are actually making the hit uh, songs. They are just there standing and you can just talk to them. You can get great insights from these people. So uh, attending to this uh, is very, very good. Uh, the other one is the Billboard Conference. Uh, one of them, I think, it happens in LA. The other one happens in Florida, as far as I remember. So uh, this is when I got to meet Pitbull, um, Enrique Iglesias, Shakira. You get to meet all these great artists. You get to talk to them one-on-one -on -one like this. You get to ask questions. And you have no idea the amount of insights you would get from these people. I learned, for example, that Pitbull is not a musician. He did not study music. He is a great business person, okay? But uh, he just learned how to rap. And uh, using his networking abilities, he actually got to the top of the music charts. Isn't that amazing? So uh, I admired his sense of, okay, I'm gonna make music, I'm gonna be successful in music, even though I'm not a musician, okay? So I got that insight from himself. Um, uh, so this is uh, another uh, route. Another one is the Grammy Association. For some reason, when people here, Grammy Association, people think, okay, this is something unreachable. This is something that I just know not. It's very easy to attend a Grammy event. It's really easy. You just go to grammypro.com. You see a lot of events happening, mixers, uh, meetings with great producers, meetings with great uh, sound engineers, uh, people that are sound designing everywhere. Uh, there's uh, here in San Francisco, there's in LA, there's Atlanta, there's New York, and you can pick the one that you like and try to attend the event. It's not that hard to get in. Um, you just go and buy your ticket. That's it, that's simple. Mm -hmm. So that's the three ones that are probably at the top of my head uh, that will really get you exposed to networking, okay? And the last one I have for you is uh, to always have a mindset of constantly learning. Uh, of course, you are here in college learning, but the problem I see is that when people graduate from college, there's a mentality about like, okay, I'm graduated, I don't need to learn more. And let me tell you, I am 42 now, and I'm, I have to constantly relearn myself because especially technology is always changing, it's always moving, right? I was getting used to the Intel processor and now the freaking M1 is killing me now. So I need to re-change everything and I have to relearn and you know, watch YouTubes and how to handle plugins better using this new operating system. So uh, it, it all comes down to your mindset. If you're constantly 
thinking, today I need to learn something new. Today I'm going to learn something new. I don't know what that's going to be. Uh, music, finances, networking, uh, uh, music genres, whatever it is, if you have always this mindset, then you're setting yourself for success. Um, I think that's the last one I have for you guys. So I'm just going to go ahead and introduce Christine, who's going to uh, lead our question and answer section of the uh, talk. Christian, thanks so much for your time. Uh, the question that I had for you, since aside from being electronic music students, we have live recording classes too. And I was wondering about the process of recording the orchestra for Pacific Mambo. Uh, did you have specific instrument sections come into the studio or was it um, one musician at a time? Just curious what the process was for recording the instrumentation. Yes, uh, yeah, great, great question, Christine. So uh, the orchestra, my orchestra is 20 people in total, uh, but that means in the DAW, it looks like 20, 250 tracks recorded, including all the subs, all the auxiliaries, and all that. Uh, that is nearly impossible to do uh, every, every one at the same time. Uh, it was probably the way back in the 40s, 1940s, 1930s, when there was only one track to record and one microphone placed in the middle. You hear a lot of recordings from Ella Fitzgerald uh, that I, you just hear one microphone, and that's the microphone that was placed in the middle. That's what you hear. But now, because we have this capability now to re-record and, uh, and, and erase and add and everything, pretty much you can do anything it's gonna work for you, for people's schedules. The schedule is always an issue, especially when you're dealing with more people, trying to put five people in one room at the same time. For some reason these days, it's really hard. <laughs> so um, the decision we made for, for the orchestra was to have sections. So we had the four trumpets recording at the same time, then a different day, the trombones, then a different day, the saxophones, uh, but first, we recorded the rhythm section. So I would say, uh, first, focus on the rhythm section. Anything that gives time or groove, that is essential for anything else that comes after that in the recording process. So uh, yeah, that's how we did it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And just a follow-up question, what yeah. microphone did you use for the winds, for instance? Since you said it wasn't the most expensive, but... Um, it was the road. Okay. The road, uh, what is it? It looks like a Noman, but it's not a Noman. I, I, I forgot the model. Uh, it, it was $200. That's it. Okay. Versus a Noman, $2,000, right? Yeah, it was just uh, one, a pair of roads that the ones, the condensers I used. And for the dynamics, I mostly use uh, Shure, 57s and 58s. That's it. Nothing else. Doable. And good cables. <laughs> okay. Okay. Hi there. Um, for what I think the Rode microphone you were talking about was the Rode NT1A. Because I, I was so. like, I was looking to buy that one, so that's why I know it. NT1A? NT1A. It's a great one, right? Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, so it sounds about right. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah that was good. Mm -hmm. um, I want to know, since you're talking about how integral EQ is in the mixing process, uh, do you have like, any tips for mixing bass? Mixing bass. Sub bass. Sub bass, not bass. Sub bass. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, that is a gorgeous frequency because it's a frequency that you don't necessarily hear, you just feel, right? So when you're mixing, you have to mix uh, with that uh, concept in mind. It's not about how it sounds here, it's more about how it's moving everything else above. So for me, that is the concept. How that is affecting the energy above here. I would say it's not necessarily about the level. I, what I've been doing recently, um, I don't want to get into plugins too much. Uh, there's the isotope uh, EQ uh, match. So let's say if you're mixing, um, what is your genre? Uh, <laughs> a lot. Uh 
grunge rock, but also like electro pop. Electro pop. Okay. So what I normally do, let's say you have uh, some tracks ready to mix. Uh, I would go straight to one song that you like that is already, already commercially released. I would uh, export it from YouTube or whatever. And then I put it in this EQ match. So what that helps me is that it, it captures the EQ of your mix and compares it with the EQ of the commercial release, right? Uh, it happens to me many times that I feel I have this great mix until I do the comparison, and I'm like, whoa, my bass is all over the top, okay? Only visually. So what I first do for low, ba for low frequencies is that I first match the level. Let's say if I have the 50K spiking too much, I match my track that has the bass lower to that volume. Now, normally what that happens is that my track loses the power that it had. It loses the, oh, it loses the energy. And I'm like, okay, I cannot really turn that up because I'm actually exceeding the commercial standards because I'm already comparing that with EQ. So this is going to trigger the question, what do I do now, right? So most likely another frequency might be canceling it. So it's very, uh, for, I think it's a little harder to hear frequencies that are canceling down there. So uh, I probably would start from a, taking out the tracks that are not in that category and mute the tracks that are most likely canceling that frequency. For example, so you're talking about sub bass. Sub bass sometimes is tracked with a bass and then sometimes it's tracked with a bass drum or a kick. So those three frequencies, if they are not good friends with each other, they might be canceling each other. So uh, that's what I will start. I will start probably setting down the levels to the comparison EQ, and without turning everything in volume, I would try to make space on the EQ. Okay? Uh, let's say if your kick is hitting on 60 hertz, uh, I might want to do a curve down on those 60 hertz that might be causing the problem. So before messing with volumes on, in that low frequency, which is so delicate, I would just make space on all the tracks that might be making the problem. I don't know if that ex, um, explains it. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah? if uh, 60 hertz is too crowded, just kind of like dip the kick a bit so it leaves some more room for the sub bass. Correct, correct, yeah. But comparing it with a commercially released track because that's yeah. your reference. Because you know, you don't know your monitors at a certain volume, or maybe your your subwoofer might be cutting a frequency that might not be the ideal. So comparing that with a commercially released track, it helps to see, okay, now that's my reference. So this is where I normally start. Of course, make sure you have a subwoofer. If you're trying to mix the frequencies with a 13 inch. Uh, most likely you're going to get a very inaccurate. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you so yeah. much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I've noticed there seems to be a lot of work around doing demos and patterns for sample libraries. Mm -hmm. And you talked about the important of importance of finances. Like, so my question is simply, does that work pay well? <laughs> wow. Well, um, uh, in my experience, it was more work that I would wish the pay was for. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I think like any company, right? I mean, the, 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 the ones that get the bigger cut are the ones that are selling the product, not the ones that are making the product. Okay. That is just a reality. Okay. Uh, I would say uh, it's half and half. Uh, it's going to pay. If you, if you know your work well, it's going gonna, it's gonna to pay. But I feel that you always have to be smart about how you're balancing your time and your finances, okay? Because uh, I'm going to give an example. I did this project for Native Instruments for about a summer. It was three, four months. And that paid my bills for those four months. But I didn't have, I didn't cut everything, everything else around me, you know, including teaching or, you know, gigging, right? So, uh because at the end of the project, I was going to run out of money. So probably my best advice is like, probably it's a good idea, yes, to, to pursue a pay from this, but also not eliminate all other source of income that you might have 
playing, uh, you know, mixing, uh, gigging, uh, anything else, right? So that's uh, that's what I would say. Yeah, great. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, by the way, going back to your question, if you get into the gaming industry, that's a different animal. That's a really great pay there. <laughs> uh, and we are in the Silicon Valley. I believe there's a lot of opportunity here. Uh, I know a couple of people that bought their million house uh, making sound designs for uh, one of those games that are like out there. Um, it's not Call of Duty, but it's equivalent to that. And I know the guy, he just spent like a year trying to make all those sounds and now he paid his house in cash. So it is, there is a lot of money in gaming, yes. Uh, I think that's the first route I probably would start. It's fun, but it's also profitable. Yeah, yeah, good question, yeah. Well, hi, I'm Joanne, and uh, I'm a musician. I had some experience in a, a friend's sort of homemade recording studio, and um, it was my first experience doing that, and you know, I'd play part of a song and then mess up and then uh, go back and try it again. And, and uh, you know, you could do f- three takes, you could do 17 takes. Uh, and I was just wondering, and, and at some point he could say, oh, we can patch that in. We can just just play it through and, and I'll, I'll fix it later <laughs> kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So I'm just wondering, I, I know that, that uh, many things can be done post-production, but I'm just wondering what's your thought about that if uh, a musician is not not uh, uh, you know not getting it right the first time, and you know how you work with someone to keep them motivated and, and play their best. Okay, um, well, yeah, yeah, great question. It happened to me many times when I was trying to get something and I would not get it right, and when you're getting paid for that, that the pressure gets even worse, right? Because you have to deliver, right? Uh, what do you do? Is that your question? What do you do if you are in a circumstance where you try to do something and it doesn't, it doesn't turn quite well? Is that, well, am I getting that right? Well, uh, yeah, but tell, if you can talk both from the musician's point of view uh, and also from you as the producer uh, point of view. Yes, uh, so I think there's two different sides here. One, are you doing it for fun or are you doing it professionally because somebody hired you and pays you to lay that out, okay? I think that's two different uh, sets here, right? If you're doing it for fun at a friend's house and you know, you're know you trying things and it doesn't happen, then nothing happens. You know, I would say my best advice is to enjoy the imperfection and enjoy the experience because this is fun, you know? Recording and messing with the takes and all that is part of the fun. Once the project, the, the project is done, then for me the fun is over, right? So the first advice is have fun with it, a plan of making mistakes, but also plan on getting better at what you do. Of course, because if you're struggling playing one chord without recording, right? This is just at home playing a chord on the piano or the guitar, and you're not getting the chord right, most likely the recording is not going to come out right, (laughs) okay? So uh, uh, as a musician, there's a significant amount of time that you do on your own training, uh, for, for singers, for example, before they come to the studio, I always recommend, recommend them to do uh, vocal coaching before they record. Because recording, at the time of the recording, is when all the good stuff comes out, but also the bad stuff is going to come out. Okay? So, uh, first advice is get better at what you do before you get into the recording studio. Mm-hmm. Second thing is, when you do too many tries, then what happens? And I like to compare this with uh, cooking. So what happens to the bread when you put it inside the oven and you leave it for too long? It, it burns. burns. Same thing with a song. When you mess with a song for too long, then it burns you. It burns your brain. It burns your judgment of the track. It starts to, things start to deteriorate. There's a point that you know, you're going, the way I see it is that you start from this idea and then you got this curve, it has some variations and then you reach the peak and then there's a point that it starts to uh, deteriorate the idea that you have because you just start to overthink too much. So I think the experience of recording 
uh, as far as stakes and how much time you spend on, on a track, you have to find your sweet spot when you can say, you know what, this is as far as it can go, I think it's time to wrap it up. And that comes with experience, you know, you, you have to monitor yourself constantly. Uh, you know, when is the right time to wrap it up? You know, because sometimes it's simple, it's better, you know. I, say, I, I would say 95% of the time, simple is better. Less is more. Yeah. One thing we did is uh, when I was getting burnt out on one song, say, okay, let's take it, let's switch to another song, play that, record that, and then come back to the first one. That's not like that. Yeah, that way. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I, uh, I'm a musician and I record myself. And I find it very difficult to separate the two because I want to play, but at the same time, I'm thinking about the gain and I'm thinking about other factors that the recording is doing. Do you recommend um, having uh, another person to do, to control the recording aspect of it while you're playing? Uh, what are you somebody play? Uh, guitar. Guitar, okay. Um, it depends. Uh, for singers, I extremely recommend it. Well, I also do vocals. Yeah, for singers because uh, you are in a mindset when you are recording, right? You, you are using a lot of diaphragm and diction and lyrics and, you know, breath. And there's only many aspects that happens when you're tracking uh, vocals. And I would not recommend tracking vocals and recording at the same time. You might attain some results. Uh, if you're singing some background vocals, that's fine. But if you want a very nice, strong delivery, I would really recommend having someone else tracking it. Uh, it would worth, what I would do budget-wise, again, being smart with your finances, I would probably do a scratch on your guitar. Let's say you're recording your album. I will record record on your own, imperfect, planning to be imperfect. Once you feel you get in the hang of it, you have a good reference, then go to a studio and ask someone to track you. And that I, th I think that's a good, because you're practicing recording. Recording also make, takes some practice, you know, having the cans, you know, and having the guy on the other side, he can hear everything you're doing, and then, you know, you get nervous, you know, like all of that takes practice, right? So uh, I would say practice first recording on your own. If you want to have uh, uh, another option, then go to an engineer. You can pay by the hour if you might. You are ready to play the song, and then you compare, you know. Sometimes even uh, some takes that are not perfect, happen to be the best because they're real, you know? And, and something about music these days, people like it real. People, you know, there's so much stuff manipulated that I think people are really liking the real stuff even though it's imperfect at times. So, uh, uh, yeah. So, uh, one more advice for you. Have someone else listen to it because we have these ideas in our head about what's perfect and what's not. But sometimes what, what we think is trash, it, it, people like it. It's just one of those things that is kind of hard to explain. So after you do a take or two, then have somebody else, you know, give you an advice. You know, hey, what do you like? You like this take or this take, you know? Try to get yourself out of that uh, mode and have someone else, uh, you know, give you their opinion. I think that's a, a, good, a good practice as well. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. This one, uh, I uh, plugged in the guitar with a vocalizer. Uh, it's pretty fun. Uh, actually, this is back to your question. I combine my knowledge that I learned here a little bit with live performance. So this is one show I did. It's just like a really short video. <laughs> Thank you. 
samples and the guitar is pretty cool, it's pretty real. Christian, I just want to thank you again for coming here. It's really wonderful to have you.